Hi everyone and welcome to this short video overview of the proposed new curriculum for the University of Connecticut School of Medicine. My name is Jason Ryan and I'm a faculty member in the Division of Cardiology. I'm also a graduate of the University of Connecticut School of Medicine and I am the co-chairman of the Curriculum Reform Steering Panel and CRISP has been meeting weekly for about the last eight months to discuss our current curriculum and changes that could be made going forward and in this video I'm going to highlight for you the framework of what we think should be done to reform the curriculum starting in 2016. Before I get into the specific changes we're proposing to the med school curriculum, let me highlight for you some of the reasons we think it's important to change at this point in time. And the first reason is because medical education is changing. Some of our competitor med schools are using new techniques and new teaching methods, and we think UConn should reform and update in order to stay current. Another reason to change is because our med school accreditation may be at risk. There is an LCME requirement for medical schools to provide opportunities for active learning, and this is one of the most common reasons that med schools are cited by the LCME. We believe we should make changes now to increase the opportunities for active learning for our students so that we don't put ourselves at risk for citations in the future. Another reason we think we should change is because students learn differently now than they did 10 years ago or even 5 years ago. This is a picture of a lecture in the Green Auditorium and it should be filled with students but there are only 5 or 6 students there. The rest of them are going to watch a recorded version of this lecture at home on their computer or portable device. Many of our incoming students have learned this way in college and even in high school. They're used to watching lectures where they can pause and rewind to hear things multiple times until they get it right. And we think we should update the curriculum to meet the needs of these students who are entering the School of Medicine. And then a final reason why we think we should change is because more and more doctors are practicing as part of a team. This is a picture of a team rounding in the hospital. And this is a typical example of what you see on hospital rounds. There's often a physician present, but also nurses and social workers and case managers and pharmacists and we think our students should start learning in teams as early as possible so they're prepared for the new healthcare environment where they won't be operating as a solo practitioner but they'll be one member of a large team. So with those changes in mind, I want to introduce the three key concepts that we want to introduce to the UConn School of Medicine curriculum. The first one is early clinical exposure. The second one is basic science in all four years. And then finally, team-based learning. So CRISP has reviewed the success of the student continuity program where students are placed in clinical practice starting in their first year and we think that program should be expanded upon. We think students should have immersion in the clinical environment for at least two half days during the first phase of the curriculum. This would be concurrent with basic science and preclinical coursework and students would really get an opportunity to tour all the different areas of the healthcare system. This might include primary care and specialty clinics but also things like physical and occupational therapy and social work we believe there are endless opportunities where students could go and observe medicine in action. There are a bunch of different goals to this early clinical exposure. One of them is to get students introduced to a professional work environment. We feel that students often view the first year of medical school as an extension of college. They come to lecture in jeans and shorts and they go home and they study from textbooks. We want to get them out of college mode. In fact, we think these clinical experiences ought to be in the morning so the students have to get out of bed early and dress professionally and go essentially as if they're employed as a healthcare practitioner. We want to help them build a professional identity through this exposure to all areas of the healthcare system. We also want to place the preclinical education in context. We feel that once students have seen a stroke patient, the education they get in the lecture hall about strokes is much improved. We think that clinical experience with actual patients is going to stimulate their learning in the preclinical sciences. The second tenet of the new curriculum is expanded basic sciences. So we want to see increased basic sciences in the curriculum over all phases, well integrated with clinical training. We think there could be great value to students revisiting basic science concepts in later years. For example, just prior to graduation, students could come back to the anatomy lab, could review histology and biochemistry. Now that they have the experience of taking care of patients, these things will have much increased meaning for them. We also think senior students can have a great role in helping junior students to place the basic science into perspective. And then the third tenet of the new curriculum is going to be team-based learning. So for team-based learning, students are going to get a lot of the content that they currently get in the lecture hall outside the classroom. So they will be offered choices of self-directed learning activities like video lectures, online resources that might include learning tools or games, and also traditional things like textbooks. And then they're going to come to school and learn in a team-based format. 
So the easiest way for me to explain this to you is to draw a picture. So we're going to have a new ballroom in the medical school where there's going to be a central podium where one or more faculty members can stand and speak to the class of students. Surrounding the central podium will be a number of tables where teams of students will sit. There may be 10 or 20 of these tables present in the ballroom. The faculty members in the middle can give lecture type material if they wish, but then the students are going to break down into groups to solve problems as teams, and the faculty member can then float from one team to the next, helping the students solve problems and helping them to learn. So the net result of this is that students are going to have collective or grouped learning in a team-based format, and we think this is going to have great advantages for them in their career. They're going to have to learn how to navigate team dynamics, like the dominant team member or the withdrawn team member, and this is exactly what's going to happen to them when they graduate and go out into clinical practice. Now for this to work, students are going to have to prepare for conference and their preparation time will be self-directed. We are going to teach them how to teach themselves. But in order to do this, there will have to be extensive school support to help them structure the preparation time. We're going to provide resources by our expert faculty and access to our expert faculty. And as I said before, there will be extensive online materials available. Importantly, these conferences are going to open with some type of preparation assessment that actually counts towards the final grade. This will do a couple of things. It will make sure the students are preparing, and it will also identify struggling students early. We want to know right away if they're struggling to get the material. Another feature of the team-based learning is that we will teach students with integrated content. Most likely, the conferences will open with a clinical presentation of disease. We'll then discuss the basic science underlying disease, the anatomy, histology, and pathology. We'll also discuss clinical things like the diagnosis and treatment of disease. And we'll discuss patient social and psychological needs. In addition, we'll go through community and public health perspectives and professionalism and ethics. So this is a sample of what one of the cases might look like for a conference. Keep in mind, this is unlikely to be exactly duplicated in conferences, just to give you an idea. But imagine, if you will, if the team-based learning session revolved around dysphagia. The students would prepare ahead of time by reviewing anatomy, physiology, pathology, and psychosocial issues around dysphagia. They would then come to the ballroom, as I showed you before, and break down into groups of about 10, probably with senior students present as well to help guide them. The groups would be charged by the facilitator to prepare an algorithm for dysphagia. This might involve the biology or the physiology or the diagnosis and management or even all of these things. Then the groups could present their algorithms to the class and the preceptor or preceptors would facilitate a large group discussion. And of course, we would have faculty development to guide the preceptors in the things they want to review with the students. So those are the three main features we foresee in the new curriculum, early clinical exposure, expanded basic sciences, and team-based learning. Now let me highlight for you some of the other features that we foresee in the new curriculum. The first is a robust launch period at the beginning of medical school to support all curricular elements to follow. So this might be a few weeks or months of some type of boot camp where students get an overview of the healthcare system and they learn some basic clinical skills and they get prepared for that early clinical exposure and for the team-based learning environment. Another important feature of the new curriculum is what we're now calling Realm Activities, which stands for Remote Active Learning Modules. These will be items that faculty will create and will be supported for creating, and this may include things like Khan Academy-like videos, games, and other online learning tools. These are the resources students are going to use in their self-directed learning time to prepare for the team-based conferences. Students will have time carved out each week to accomplish Realm work, and they'll be expected to do it to be prepared for conferences. And once again, the goal is to teach students to learn on their own. We want to provide the resources and to have them decide what works best for them so that they can become lifelong learners. Other new curriculum features are a commitment that clinical skills and laboratory experience like anatomy and histology will be part of the educational configuration. We also foresee special teams called vital teams, which are vertically integrated teams aligned in learning. These will be groups of students from all four years that will meet regularly to discuss topics like current events, health policy, ethics, and social sciences. So for example, a vital team could meet now and discuss the Ebola outbreak. These will be senior and junior students coming together to learn from one another. Another key feature of the new curriculum is a commitment to foster faculty as educators. We understand that the role of the teacher is going to be transformed. There will be more facilitating, guiding, and mentoring, but there will be less lecturing. And there is a commitment from the administration to financially support faculty as educators, and the scholarly work of educators for promotion will be robust in the new curriculum. 
We foresee the new curriculum as divided into three stages. The first one, which we're now calling training, the second one, which we're calling experiential, and the third one, which we're calling advanced. And the length of each of these will need to be determined by subcommittees going forward. So the first stage is a training stage, and this is what we might now consider first and second year. Students would have time to review the realm material. They would have conference learning based on cases, as I discussed. They would attend clinical skills. They would do laboratory, like anatomy, histo, and path, and also the virtual anatomy, like the anatomy in the sim. So here's an example of what the first stage, the training stage, might look like. Keep in mind this is just a hypothetical example. So Monday morning they might have clinical practice, which would be that early clinical exposure I talked about. In the afternoon they would have team-based learning in the ballroom. Tuesday morning could be clinical skills, followed by more team-based learning in the afternoon in the ballroom. Wednesday morning might be another morning of clinical practice, followed by vital or interprofessional teams in the afternoon. Thursday morning could be lab or virtual lab, followed by more team-based learning, and they might have an entire day during the week of self-directed learning or realm time, which we would help them to structure. The second stage of the curriculum is the experiential stage. This is a lot like what we think of as third-year medicine now. There would be time for realm, there would be conferences, and importantly, there would be clinical rotations. And then the advanced stage is a lot like what we think of as fourth year of medical school now. There would be advanced clinical rotations. These students might facilitate conferences with junior students. There could be an advanced boot camp to prepare students for life after graduation, and there would be time for scholarly endeavors. And then there are some activities that will occur in all four years of the curriculum. These will include a longitudinal practice, much like SCP, interprofessional activities, and those vital teams. Now let me talk about some of the roles for faculty in the new curriculum. One of the biggest needs is going to be for expert faculty to develop realm materials. And this will include things like educational videos, like this one you're watching right now. So I'm making this video at my desk with a set of headphones and a simple computer program. It's actually fairly easy to make. If you say something wrong, you can just say it again and then cut out the error. And the nice thing about videos is you're not limited by the number of hours available in the green or blue auditorium with students. You can make videos in your area of of expertise and you can make as many of them as you want and students will watch them on their own time. We're also going to need other realm material besides videos, things like online tutorials and sample questions and the administration has made a commitment to provide support to expert faculty to create these materials. And then of course we are going to need team-based learning facilitators and we are going to provide education to help faculty get prepared to lead these integrated conferences which may involve talking to students about subject outside an individual faculty member's area of expertise. And then we are also going to need content experts for the team-based learning. So for example in the dysphagia module that I showed you as a hypothetical example we would need content experts in neurology and GI and infectious disease and basic sciences to help guide the facilitators of those conferences in all those diverse areas that they would be leading the students through. We will need clinical preceptors for the early clinical exposure and continuing clinical preceptors for SCP and all clinical rotations. And then we will continue to need faculty for anatomy and histology and clinical skills much like we do right now. Finally, let me finish this video by discussing what we believe are the benefits of this new curriculum. For the school as a whole, we think this curriculum is going to place us at the forefront of medical education institutions, and this is going to raise the reputation of the school and benefit all of us. For faculty, we're going to be using the latest teaching techniques, including team-based learning and online video creation. These are skills that are going to be needed for the coming age of medical education, and our faculty members will gain valuable experience in this area. Students are going to learn how to teach themselves, which is essential going forward because medicine changes so rapidly. And they're also going to know how to function as members of a team, which is critical for the coming age of collaboration in medicine. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, the new curriculum is going to benefit our future patients. If you think about it, every one of us on the faculty here may someday be a patient of a graduate of the UConn School of Medicine. And we are going to need doctors who can teach themselves new skills and who can function as members of a team. And that is the type of graduate we are going to deliver from this new curriculum. So that concludes this video overview of the proposed changes to the School of Medicine curriculum. We will be holding open forums and then asking for a faculty vote to endorse the curriculum, and we hope we can count on your support. Thank you very much.